Yep, I'm building an Eco Corvette. What's up guys, welcome back to Legit Street Cars. My name is Alex and it's true, I'm gonna be building a 40 mile per gallon Corvette that doesn't sacrifice a thing. In fact, I plan on adding more power to this car at the same time because who wants to drive a slow Corvette? I don't wanna drive a slow Corvette. Do you wanna drive a slow Corvette? It's not happening. I don't want a slow Corvette, so we're gonna make this thing potentially faster all while saving fuel. It's kind of like the best of all worlds. Now, don't worry, in this video, I'm gonna explain everything. So we're gonna go over the goals, the modifications to reach these goals, and how I'll be testing the car, and we're getting into eco-modding in this very video. But first, we have some stuff on this 20-year-old Corvette that we must fix. We have some parts we have to replace, and some things that we need to clean out. And then, I'm gonna be explaining to you one of the biggest modifications to this car for fuel efficiency, and that is running the computer in open loop speed density lean burn mode. And I know it sounds kind of cool, it's a little bit complicated, but I promise you by the end of this video, you're gonna get the gist of it. And if you don't, towards the end, I'll just throw in some clips of my super not eco-friendly cars, just tearing it up. But trust me, this mode that we're gonna be trying to run this computer in, something the Japanese have been using for years. It's really cool, it's really exciting, and I can't wait to share this with you. Oh, and because I'm kind of a child and I can't keep this until later on in the video, the tuner that I've partnered up with for this build, his great-grandfather invented the spark plug. The real spark plug, he invented it. How cool is that? All right, before we get to any eco-modding, we have to figure out why our engine is running like this. So my first step was scanning the car for codes. I wasn't getting any codes at all. And especially on an older engine like this, your next step is to just check over all the vacuum lines and all the vacuum tubes. Uh, with old age, these things can break. So this is what I found. This is a PCV hose, totally cracked. This is under vacuum, so it's leaking. And then if we look over here, we have the actual PCV valve that's inside of here and the tube leading to the intake is all kind of smushed and this is actually sucking in air as well. So this is unmetered air. It's not being registered by our mass airflow sensor. Uh, so the computer for the engine is not able to adjust fueling properly and this can cause a rough running situation. Our final somewhat normal issue with the Corvette has to do with the oil pressure. Now I think the engine's in excellent condition, but as you can see here in the cluster, the oil pressure gauge is pegged to maximum and this is actually a pretty common issue with this era GM cars especially the C5 Corvette and it has to do with this guy right here the oil pressure sensor now I've done quite a few of these in my day but even if I hadn't I would not be worried about tackling this job at home because just like all of my other cars I have an awesome factory style workshop manual and you guys can get one of these also for practically any car in existence for only $20 so check it out uh, I typed an oil pressure sensor, and then we're gonna scroll down a little bit to the engine section, and here we go. How to replace the oil pressure sensor and or switch. And look at this, we have step-by-step -step work instructions with pictures, and if you guys don't know how to do one of the steps, they have a hyperlink, so in this case, uh, they tell you you have to remove the entire intake manifold to replace this sensor, no problem. We have pictures, instructions, and torque specs, very easy to follow. Guys, you can rip apart your entire car and put it back together with these workshop manuals, and I use them on all of my cars, as you guys may have seen in some of my Mercedes videos. So like I said, it's 20 $20, roughly $20 for one of these manuals for any car in existence. I'll leave a link down below. This is the best money you'll ever spend in the garage. These manuals are a total lifesaver. Uh, now, you can actually do the oil pressure switch with a special socket that someone came up with, uh, but I wanna remove the intake on this car anyway, get some fresh gaskets, uh, clean it out a little bit, clean the throttle body. So we're gonna remove the intake manifold uh, to replace this sensor. That is exactly how GM wants you to do it. Uh, so as I work, I'm gonna explain to you guys the goals of the project and also exactly how I plan to get to 40 MPG. Uh, and then we're moving right along into the actual modifications to the car in this video. So let's get to it. The EcoVet will be my 1999 six-speed 
three-speed manual C5 Corvette with 138,000 original miles on the clock. I've chosen the C5 because I want this to be a project that anybody can duplicate at home, and the C5 is a very affordable car as I only paid $8,500 for mine. I'm also interested to see if we can achieve amazing fuel economy using an old school pushrod V8 without any high tech features like direct injection or cylinder deactivation. So the intake manifold on a C5 Corvette takes about 20, 30 minutes to remove. It's very, very easy. As opposed to the LS1 Camaro and Firebird, the F body is a little bit more difficult because half the engine is underneath the cowl. But uh, as you can see, here is our oil pressure sensor. I already unplugged it. And then our 27 millimeter socket just goes right over like this. And believe it or not, you can sneak these sensors out without removing the intake, but that can be kind of a pain in the butt too. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to take this intake off anyway. Uh, the valves inside of there, it's kind of hard to see, but they're actually really clean. Everything's in good shape, but we just have some carbon buildup here. So I'm just gonna take uh, a rag and some brake cleaner, just kind of clean this up as best as possible. Get some fresh gaskets in here. I have a feeling this thing has never ever been off. Uh, so these really don't tend to leak, but why not get a fresh set? And this also gives me the opportunity to just take a look uh, at the injector nozzles and make sure that none of them are clogged. Look at how tiny uh, the little holes are for the injector. So those look to be in good shape. Uh, and the Corvette runs really well. So outside of the uh, broken vacuum tubes, this thing runs like a champ. So I don't suspect any injector issues. Uh, so I'm gonna clean up the intake, clean up uh, the head a little bit, the intake ports on the head and we're putting her back together and moving on. Now, something that's important to me is that this project will follow the KISS principle. If you don't know what that is, it stands for keep it simple, stupid. That will be my motto here, as I wanna do as little as possible to reach my goal. Here's an example. Lighter wheels will help with fuel savings, but I'm not gonna spend a couple grand on that right off the bat. We're gonna max this out on a very tight budget first, and then we'll move on to more involved or expensive modifications later if they're needed. The goal for the EcoVet is 40 miles per gallon on the highway without sacrificing any horsepower or torque. My plan is to actually give it a bump in power, which is primarily gonna come from custom tuning. Custom tuning is gonna be the key to this entire project, and I've partnered with an amazing LS tuner named Mike Hornback of Hack Tuning, and I've secured dyno time with a really awesome shop, Straight Line Performance here in Illinois. The cliff notes on tuning is that we're gonna make this thing run much, much leaner. But seriously, stay until the end of the video to learn a lot more on that. And take a look at this throttle body. Man, that looks clean. Now I'm going with a highway MPG goal for its consistency and its ease of testing. City MPG testing is very confusing and it has an infinite amount of variables. This really depends on how bad of traffic your city has. I mean, if you sit in traffic here in Chicago for an hour, even a three cylinder car is gonna get really bad fuel economy. This highway goal of 40 MPG will be set at a speed of 60 miles an hour, and I'm going with that because it's a respectable cruising speed. Now I know that some of you guys, depending on where you live, go much faster, but our speed limit here is only 55 miles an hour. It's hard to get exact figures because the new government fuel economy testing is complicated, but on the fueleconomy.gov website, they show a highway test speed that averages 48 miles per hour so I'm definitely much higher than that. Oh, an interesting fact, the same year Mazda Miata that weighs 1,000 pounds less has half of the cylinders and less than half of the horsepower only beats the C5 by one MPG on the highway. Seriously, Mazda? Great job. Of course, I'll test the car at higher highway speeds just to let you know how it does. And for quicker updates on this build and fuel economy results in between videos, follow me at Legit Street Cars on Instagram and and Facebook. And if you're wondering, I did get a good baseline MPG number on my car because I bought it five hours away from my house. So I managed 30 MPG and an average speed of 65 miles an hour, but that was only with 24 PSI of tire pressure. So I think I could have squeezed 31 MPG easily had the previous owner just filled up the tires properly. Along with tuning, another key factor will be gearing. The advantage of having a large V8 is that the car can chug along nicely at a very 
very low RPM. We're going to see how far we can go with tuning first, but eventually I may experiment with rear end gearing or I'll get a different six gear installed in the transmission. And in that case, I'll be able to keep the performance factory 342 rear gears and have the best of both worlds. All right, let's test out this new oil pressure sensor. See if it works. Let's see if we have oil pressure that always helps. And look at that. I finally have a sensor that's not pegged out. And we got pretty decent oil pressure too, not bad. All right, we got our first spark plug out. It looks to be an AC Delco and it's in excellent condition. Not sure if this is original. This car uh, was dealer maintained actually, so these could have been replaced. But either way, we're putting fresh plugs in her and we're replacing the AC Delcos with some NGK TR55. So if you guys know uh, your LS1 engines, you know that a lot of the naturally aspirated guys go with these TR55s. My tuner likes them, I like them. So that is what we're going with. And of course, we're also gonna be replacing the spark plug wires. These are the ones that came off the car. Who knows how old these things are, but we're gonna be replacing them with these nice shiny red ones. So I'll leave a link down below to the spark plug and wire kit. I got it on Amazon, of course, uh, for less than a hundred bucks. So not too much to see here, guys. I'm gonna replace all the plugs and wires and we're moving right along. To complete this tune-up, we're also replacing the fuel filter, which I believe to be original, or at the very least, it's very old. Now, the 97 and 98 Corvettes had a traditional regulator on the rail, but in 99, they incorporated the regulator in the fuel filter, and then I believe in 03 and 04, it was in the fuel tank. So if you're getting a longer cold start or a long start after the car's been sitting for a few hours like this, Then you may have a bad regulator. I wanted to replace the filter for maintenance purposes anyway, so this works out. I picked up a factory AC Delco filter and regulator off Amazon again for only $62. I started the car and then let it sit for a few hours, and this is how it starts now. <laughs> Okay, awesome, that's fixed too. So we're moving on to some more normal maintenance, but with economy and performance in mind, which means we need to run a good synthetic oil in everything. I'm gonna be changing all of the oils in the car to Amsoil Synthetic. Now, probably as much as the entire premise of this build, this statement will likely stir up some comments below, but here it goes. Generally speaking, a good synthetic oil will improve your car's fuel economy. I'm not saying it's gonna be a huge improvement, but a very high quality synthetic like AMS oil reduces friction better and flows better on cold start, reducing a pumping loss. Synthetics also maintain their viscosity longer than conventional oil. And I recently found out that AMS oil was the first to sell synthetic oil here in the United States. So along with engine oil, I changed the transmission fluid, which is super easy. Just pull out the drain plug and then fill it up from the top plug. Dude, these squeeze pack things are awesome. No need for a pump or anything literally just squeeze in the bag. Uh, it's like we're not gonna waste any fluid whatsoever. This is great. I replaced the differential oil with fresh Amsoil synthetic as well. So now our engine and our driveline will have just a little bit less resistance that should result in slightly better fuel economy. All right, now that we're done with the maintenance and repairs on the C5, we are moving on to eco mods. And guys, eco mods don't always have to be boring modifications. In fact, you're probably doing eco mods to your car right now for performance gains and you don't even realize that they're helping you out in the fuel economy department too. So long tube headers, things like putting lighter or smaller diameter pulleys on the front of your engine. These are all things that aid in efficiency. So they're gonna give you more power and better fuel economy at the same time. So our next mod uh, is gonna do just that. This is gonna make the car look cool and it's gonna help out with aerodynamics and that is lowering the car. So the C5 Vet has a leaf spring style suspension. Uh, so the fronts are kind of hard to see, but basically we're gonna crank on some bolts. There's one right there, uh, one on the other side and you can get a better idea of what this looks like in the rear. There's a leaf spring in the rear as well. Uh, so this right here, we're actually going to uh, bring this nut up a little further and that's actually gonna lower the suspension of this car for free. So you can lower it uh, a little bit with the stock bolts or you can get aftermarket bolts if you wanna go even lower. But this is going to lower the car. It's gonna be more aerodynamic and it's gonna cut through the air like butter and aid in our goal of 40 MPG. And it's a few days later and the C5 is all cleaned up and looking 
pretty and take a look at its new stance. Now, I did find out that the non-Z51 suspension package cars like this one can only be lowered about a half inch on the stock bolts. So I think what I'm gonna do is order up some aftermarket bolts and lower this car even more fill up this fender gap but take a look at this for $93 off of Amazon we have a brand new factory GM vacuum tube hose assembly with a new PCV valve on that side and on that side valve cover uh, so I have put about 40 miles on this car since doing all the work that you guys just saw and replacing that vacuum tube assembly and she purrs like a kitten and runs perfect so let's get into speed density open loop lean burn tuning and for that we have a special guest. We have my 1000 horsepower nine second turbo Trans Am, which is tuned in speed density. So we're gonna take a look at the stock map on the C5 and the heavily modified map on the turbo Trans Am. Nitrous, oh, he hit it too. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Got him. <laughs> so the C5 and the Trans Am were originally equipped with mass airflow sensors along with many, many other modern day fuel injected vehicles. So the C5 still has its mass airflow sensor. It's right here and what this does is exactly what you think it does. It senses the amount of airflow that goes past it and that is what's ingested by the engine. So by using that sensor and a few other ones, the engine's computer can determine how much fuel to squirt in to create the proper air fuel ratio. Now a mass airflow sensor is fantastic on a stock factory car. This can adjust on the fly for changes in temperature and elevation along with the map sensor. But if you have a modified car that you want full control of your fueling over, or or if you've gone boosted like on this car, they can become a restriction and it can be beneficial to run in speed density mode, which means you disable the mass airflow sensor. Now you don't necessarily need to physically remove the mass airflow sensor. I did in this case because I have custom tubing uh, from the intercooler because I have a turbocharger. Um, but on most speed density cars, the primary sensor you're gonna be using to calculate load uh, and also make some adjustments due to elevation and whatnot is a map sensor. So this is a three bar map sensor. The factory one is all the way in the back of the intake manifold. So all cars that have a mass airflow sensor also have a pre-written fuel map, which I'm gonna show you right now, so that if this sensor were to fail, in most cases, the car will still run perfectly fine because the engineers have written a map. So basically they know the amount of fuel that the car needs. They know the efficiency of the engine at every load and at every RPM. So these are the fuel maps from the Trans Am and the C5. This is off the Trans Am. This is the C5 on the left. This is called a primary VE table. And what this is showing you is basically the efficiency of the engine. So you have engine RPM here, KPA on this side. This is a reading from the map sensor, uh, manifold absolute pressure. And in between are all populated numbers which are indicating the efficiency. So you can literally go into the tune. We're using HB tuners. You can click on a number, for example, highlight it and just type in whatever you want. So we've just uh, richened this up a little bit by typing in a 105 right there. I'm not gonna actually save that. Uh, and when you have this on a dyno or on the street or at the track with a wideband uh, hooked up to it, you can get your reading and kind of compare and make the car run richer or leaner at whatever RPM and whatever map sensor reading you want. So you have full control of the fueling with this table and most cars that have a mass airflow sensor will actually run just fine if that sensor goes out or it's disconnected because the engineer have created this table on a dyno or road testing. They know exactly how the engine is supposed to run and they can get pretty close just running off of this without any input from the mass airflow sensor. So you'll see on this side with the Trans Am, we're going up to 315 kPa. That's because we're getting into positive air pressure because it has a turbocharger. Whereas on the C5 side, it only goes up to 105, which is just normal atmospheric pressure because we're not adding any boost. Does that make any sense to you guys at all? No? Well, here you go. Uh, 
so anyway, most of the guys with turbochargers and superchargers will end up going with a speed density tune like this. So let's move on to open loop. Now open loop basically is forgetting about the O2 sensors. So right now the Trans Am is tuned in closed loop tuning. So what that means is that it does take readings from the O2 sensors, the regular stock narrowband O2 sensors, and it takes those into account for fueling when you're just driving around town or cruising on the highway. Now when you go wide open throttle, your engine's computer is no longer looking at data from the narrowband O2 sensors. Instead, it's pretty much just running off of that pre-written fuel map. But when you're cruising on the highway, when you're just normally putzing around town and your engine is at full operating temperature, the car is in what's called closed loop, which means it's taking a look at all the sensors, including those narrowband O2s, and it's counting on those O2 sensors to determine if the car is running too rich or too lean, and then it's able to adjust the air fuel ratio to what everybody has determined to be the most efficient air fuel ratio of 14.7 to 1. So a 14.7 to 1 air fuel ratio or a stoichiometric air fuel ratio is fantastic. This is what's used on pretty much all mass produced vehicles for a reason. The factory has to factor in many variables, including fuel efficiency, how smooth an engine runs, the temperature that it runs, the amount of power that it outputs. So many factors have come into play and 14.7 7 to 1 is ideal for most, but not for us. So similar to eliminating the mass airflow sensor, we don't want these narrowband O2 sensors bringing us back down to 14.7 to 1 because we want to run this engine leaner. The leaner you run an engine, the less fuel that it uses up. So that brings us to lean burn. And if this open loop, closed loop stuff didn't make any sense to you at all, then here's another clip. And that leaves us with lean burn mode or activating lean burn, however you wanna say it. I think this is gonna be the biggest modification that we're gonna to make to this car in order to reach our goal of 40 MPG highway. So what is lean burn? It's exactly what you guys are probably thinking. It's running the engine leaner. So leaner than 14.7 to one. So the higher up you go numerically, so 16 or 17 to one air fuel means you're running leaner. If you're running leaner, you're using less fuel and you're getting better fuel economy. So lean burn is nothing new. This has been used for many decades, primarily by the Japanese. Uh, so some Hondas and some Toyotas, uh, but all in Japan, I don't think there was ever a car that could run lean burn legally from the factory in the States. And this is because when you run an engine leaner, the engine does run uh, hotter. And that means that you're going to create more NOx. NOx is a gas that's emitted out of your tailpipe uh, and it is controlled by a catalytic converter. And if you run the car too lean, your NOx level will go up quite a bit. So you would either need to run a special kind of cat uh, or in the United States, they just don't allow it at all. So correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think any cars from the factory can run lean burn here. Uh, but in other countries, like for example, in Australia, the LS engines in the Holdens have a factory lean burn mode. So what this is uh, from the factory is when you're cruising on the highway, when you're not mashing the gas pedal, when you don't need full fuel enrichment, it goes into lean burn mode. And in some cases on the Hondas, it'll run like 20 to one air fuel, something crazy like that. And as you could imagine, running that lean of an air fuel ratio is definitely going to help you save fuel. Uh, so in our case here, we can't just simply rip off the Holden LS computer. I mean, we could, but technically it's not legal to activate full-blown lean burn here in the United States. And we want to keep this thing emissions compliant. We don't want to mess around with the exhaust. Uh, and if we go too crazy with AFR, we do have to monitor cylinder temperature as well. I mean, you could literally melt your engine down if it's not designed specifically for lean burn mode. So what we're going to do uh, is kind of our own way of making this car run leaner, which is what I've explained, which is getting rid of the mass airflow sensors, disregarding what the narrowband O2s are telling the 
computer to do and we're gonna fine tune this to run maybe 16, 16 and a half air fuel. We're not entirely sure on the number just yet and this is why I have teamed up with Mike Hornback of Hack Tuning and with Straight Line Performance because we're gonna be on the dyno taking a lot of measurements, air fuel measurements, a lot of logging. They're gonna be getting data from me on my one hour trip back and forth from the dyno. So we're gonna be really fine tuning this and if we have to, we will get an EGT probe in the exhaust manifold to make sure I don't melt this thing down. But like I said, we're gonna keep it simple here. We're gonna take baby steps. We're gonna see uh, what some moderate uh, tuning can do with this car. And we're also gonna be tuning it for performance and as well. And the reason we can do that is because lean burn is only going to be activated when we're cruising on the highway at a steady state, low load, low RPM, where the engine doesn't really have that much demand on it. So that way we can run leaner when we need it to, and we can also run more power at wide open throttle because that has nothing to do with those RPMs and those map readings, those parameters uh, when we're cruising on the highway. So those two will be basically completely separate of each other so we can have power and efficiency at the same time. All right, I'm racing a C5 Vet. Let's see if I can take him out. Point six zero to 60 guys. That is awesome. Now, like I said, Mike's great grandfather literally invented the spark plug. I'll put a link down below if you guys want to read about it on his site. Uh, and Mike and I have actually worked together for many, many years. I haven't seen him though in probably like, a, I don't know, eight years or so. He actually used to tune the Turbo Trans Am and then I moved further away from their shop. Uh, so at that point I bought HP tuners and I just learned how to do it myself. But I definitely need Mike and I need Nick at Straight Line for this because there's just gonna be so much more thought and he is doing this stuff every single day. So uh, it's gonna be a fun experience. I'm gonna take you guys with me. The next episode is literally getting a baseline uh, dyno number from this car to make sure that at the end of this project we haven't lost any power and then we're getting right into tuning in the next episode so we're going to be tuning it for power and fuel efficiency and we're going to be measuring things like injector pulse width on the dyno so we can get an immediate uh, kind of result to know if we're going in the right direction that way I don't have to drive the car a couple hundred miles uh, to figure out if we've made an improvement uh, and we're probably not going to go off of the MPG uh, factory readout in the cluster those aren't the most accurate in in the world so I'll probably be doing the old school where we fill it up see how many gallons we put in divide it by how many miles we have driven uh, and that will give us our MPG rating so anyway at this point guys I am all ears if you guys have any suggestions on how to test the car on modifications we can do to the car but you got to keep our goal in mind so of course lighter wheels long tube headers a lighter flywheel all sorts of crazy stuff will definitely increase the fuel economy for this car but we want to do this with as little work as possible because I do think it's achievable primarily with tuning and maybe later we'll mess around uh, with gearing. We'll, we'll see guys. But anyway, with that being said, I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something and I hope that you're into this project. This is totally different. I have not found anything like this on the internet of trying to eco mod a C5 and not totally destroy the car. I could drop a four cylinder in here and call it a day, but I do not want to do that. So if you did like this video, make sure hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you're new, share the video, all that good stuff that you normally do. And most importantly, have an awesome day and I'll see all of you in the next video.